I know it's going to be a very stress-free week for me. I had a pretty stress-free week last week. Right. No controversies, right. no issues, wasn't trending for any reason. First off, I know you. You're a jerk, but you're not like a mean person. So everybody back the F off, my friend Mike Florio. That's right. You back the F off, my man Mike Florio. Okay, that's what I said. I said F you hear that? All right. That's what I said. It's weird right. to be at the Super <laughs> I know. Bowl. And swearing? And swearing. <laughs> yes. 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 I'm going to wait a, wa a while. Okay. We get I'll warm you up. We've got the live show Wednesday night. First ever right. live production. PFTPM. Chris Sims unbuttoned. Will you swear at the venue? What? I can't what wait. like little kids there? You can uh, be like Green Day. Are you Billy Joe? That, but first of all, it's a ball. And if the kid doesn't have ID of 21 or older, his ass is getting thrown out. That's true. Your ass is out of here, kid. If you haven't heard All the right. word by the time you're 21, there's nothing we can do for you. Right. And in this day and age, like right now, 2020, with everything that's accessible on the How internet. How old were you the first time you heard that word? Oh, uh, I mean, I was young. Like, I want to be like four or five. Wow. Yeah. Big I was Phil. six. Oh, you heard Phil say it? Big Phil from Kentucky. I mean, you just you couldn't. Yes, that was coming out of his mouth. No doubt about it. He was scared. I was on the Regis Philman show, all right, before it was Regis and Kathy Lee. Yeah. You mean Philbin or Philman? Regis Philbin. Philbin. <laughs> Thank you. And Regis Philman had a different show. Yeah, yeah, did he? Yeah. And then so I'm on Regis Philbin, and he's asking me all these questions, and, and my parents were sitting there, and they always tell me this story because they were mortified because I had just start, learned the word and they were afraid it was going to come out on, you know, ABC, Good Morning, you know, Regis Filming. So that was a big issue. So did that, you walk out to Regis and say, what's up? I didn't say it. I didn't. Oh. Now, that is the same day I looked at uh, Danny DeVito, and I looked at him, and I said, Dad, why is he so short? <laughs> and my dad said, Danny DeVito was like, you little f kid shut up <laughs> but what up everybody why did they have you on regis philbin it was something my you have dad. a book tour no what, it was my dad i don't know it was my dad and they brought my me my mom and was it after know. the super bowl or no something? it was even before that i don't know why How just old were quarter, you? i was four and a half five years old right so i don't know why i was on but i was on we, we need that video i have it's it it's got to be so i have it all right so, good yeah. we have to have so, but Kristen's on button pftpm what up you know the deal rate review we got it all going we got an ama today ask me anything okay uh, yes you heard mike caused a stir last week Do we about patrick mahomes again? and to make this even more odd dun, 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 mahomes foot on my bobblehead broke as it was being packed to come here to miami the hex is in he jinxed him already it's already started I can't believe it. You're such a bad luck guy. You Scrooge, you. Holy crap. Yep, it's all taped up down here. This is not real, and that does not look like Jimmy Garoppolo. That looks like Nick Bosa with number 10 on. I don't know. They did a bad job of that, manufacturers. Yeah, I'm glad that the foot was repaired. See, yeah. it is fixable. Any injury can be healed. And that's We're going to get into that, though. We no, have we're some not. No, we no. have some questions oh. about it. Oh, God, I can only imagine. <laughs> all, right. Um, all right, and the last thing we do, we got to pub our Wednesday live podcast yes. i know you I was, talked about it yeah. but i cut you off uh but pftpm chris sims unbuttoned the playwright irish pub yep miami beach eventbrite.com there were some additional tickets released it was sold out until it wasn't yep and uh that's where we will be wednesday 5 to 7 p.m eastern which is early enough there yeah. won't be anyone there who is overly lubricated other than you and me yeah. between 5 and 7 p.m. Well, Eastern. we'll make sure they reach our level as the, the night goes on. Peter King has guaranteed me that there will be no hecklers, which tells me there will be hecklers. Well, I mean, if you're not being heckled, you know I'm going to egg everybody on to heckle you anyway. So you're going to get heckled. We know that. So why did stop. I agree to do this? I don't know why you did, but you're going to have to deal with it. And we're going to have fun. And then also for our week of PFT... We have an amazing week. I mean, we have star-studded guest after star-studded guest. Uh, an amazing, whether it's Stefan Diggs, Kirk Cousins, Alvin Kamara, uh, Russell Wilson, Drew Brees. I mean, come on. Tua, McCaffrey, Derrick Henry. Do we think that Kirk Cousins knows that he agreed to be on this show with me? I, th I think he probably got a like quick rundown. Probably he's probably getting it like today, where yeah. he's getting like the rundown. Do of the you things. think he'll he's, cancel? He's probably went. No, he's not going to cancel. But I bet you when they told him Pro Football Talk, he probably paused and was like, "Wait, you mean the the one with Florio?" And they're like, and he was like, "All right, I'll do it. All right, yeah." Um, I bet you, yeah. Uh, well, see, and that's the thing. They get the, the the beauty of this is, and people complain like, "Oh, you're just going to have a bunch of guys plugging their sponsors." Well, 
it's a fair trade-off to ask them one question about whoever it is that is paying them the fee to be here all week so we can talk to them. Yeah. So in a 15-minute interview, if we have to spend one minute talking about their partner that has them here, that I'm fine with that. I, I, I enjoy it. I actually end up learning stuff about different products. We learned about things. spam a couple yeah, of years ago. Yeah, we learned about everything. I mean, we've seen some cool products come by. Russell Wilson last year brought some cool Oakley. Remember, he had you the, tried the to Oak take them. I did. I wanted to take them, uh, but he didn't let it happen. So, all right, let's get into it. You want to read them off? You want me to read them off? We got an AMA. Go we got ahead. a good you, list you, here. Let's go, let's go back and forth. Go ahead. All pick right. one and let's answer it. All right, I'm going to start right at the top, okay? Gigi McDonald, what's up? What kind of scheme do you think Shanahan and Sala will come up to stop Casey's passing attack? Coverage, disruption, all of those. Well, okay, Gigi, um, it's a good question, but I think th this is something Mike and I have hit on a lot. You know, Let me ask you this first yeah, based on ahead. the actual question. Right. How much will Kyle Shanahan be involved in coming up with the defensive game plan? Does he completely allocate and... Uh, delegate that to Robert Sala, or does he get involved? In I think for the most part, he he delegates it to Sala. I think this might be a week because of the extended time and the nature and dangerousness of the Kansas City Chiefs to where maybe he butts his head in there a little bit more. I don't know that, uh, but I just this is just me knowing my friend as a person and on a personal level. I would think that they're going to have at least one trick up their sleeve. But, Gigi, this is a defense in San Francisco. They don't change what they do. This is what they do. They play the Seattle scheme, the Seattle defense. That's where Robert Sala came from. They really don't change it much. It's one of my complaints. Now, they get away with it because they have great talent on that side of the ball right now, and especially a great front four. But uh, I, I think it is one of the interesting aspects of this matchup, too, is because Kansas City sees this defensive scheme a lot. They've seen it four times the last – you know, two years with the, the Los Angeles Chargers, and they've seen other teams go along with it. So uh, I, I don't think they're going to change it a lot. I think there's just going to be a change in approach in their pass rush attack maybe, and that's probably the biggest change. Who, who is the guy with the 49ers who is responsible for And you may not know the answer to yeah. this, but there's got to be a guy who is the self-scout-thyself guy Ooh. to look at their defense right. and figure out – how their defense maybe has some tells, some tendencies, some things that Andy Reid and Eric Bieniemy can exploit yeah. when they attack that Seattle-based defense at the 49ers use. Yeah, I, you know, that's a quality control guy. I mean, who's the one that is responsible for breaking down the film, finding the potential flaws that can be girded up based upon the specific opponent they're going to I, I think it is partly going to be the quality control guy who's going to hand it off to Kyle. Then Kyle's going to see, you know, the breakdowns of these things. And he's going to come up with common themes that he figures out. Uh, I think also think, you know, hey, their analytics department. You know, of course, they have an analytics department to keep track of these type of things. So I would bet you they're going to be uh, a big part of Shanahan last week at some point looking about what he's done as of, you know, the last half of the year to see if there's any glaring tendencies where he needs to change it up oh Kittle ran an out route nine out of ten times okay well this week we got to make him run it in route you know five out of ten times whatever it may be uh I don't know the answer to that you're right there's no specific person but I know Kyle has a lot it's of people to do it he Kyle have, has a lot of it. people into all of that stuff whether it's you know he's gonna exhaust every angle and that's one of the good things about Shanahan and that's why I think there's some Belichick parallels here too he dives into every angle of making an org organization successful You've spoken from time to time about your belief that the Chiefs defense should crap or get off the pot, yeah. push the issue, either give up a score or force a turnover, but get off the field so the offense can get yeah. back on. Do you think that the 49ers defense will have any of that mentality toward the Chiefs offense? You know, they always rush with four guys. Yeah. Could you see them maybe blitzing more often just to force the issue? Yeah. Get after Mahomes. Right. And if it blows up and they score, so be it. But let's rattle him. Let's not make it about whether or not Joey Bosa, D Ford, and company can chase him around. Sure. And he can buy enough time to find somebody open. We have to force the issue. We have to press this. We have to get him uncomfortable. And we have to confuse him with where we're bringing the pressure and how many guys are coming instead of just him accepting it's only going to be four guys yeah, right. and he's got to just avoid them and he'll be fine. Right. I, I mean, I think as a, as philosophically, I think the 49ers want to just rush the four, drop the seven to what you're saying, and then hope you kick a field goal. And then Shanahan thinks him and his offense are going to go down and score a touchdown. A lot like we've always talked about with New England. But I do think like your question here is very real. I do think you, you can't just sit and do the four-man rush all game long. You cannot. Mahomes has proven that he he can he, he'll he'll be able to beat that. He's just too gifted of a player right now. So I think what you'll see is some curveballs and some blitzes 
to just stop him from the floating around, moving around, attacking the line of scrimmage, keeping the eyes. I think they're going to try to clog lanes. They're going to have to take a little bit of a Russell Wilson, uh, I think, approach here. So that's a benefit the 49ers do have is they played a guy like that to where, yeah, there was a conscious effort in Week 17 and that great Monday night game we saw between the Seahawks and the 49ers where uh, rush five, rush six, not not as not always just about confusing him and doing that, but to take away the scramble rush lanes. And I do think you got to do that a little bit with Mahomes. If you, you can't let him get into a rhythm. No, right. You can't let him get comfortable. No. And you have to make him wonder on every play. Is somebody else coming? Is somebody going to pop through? Is it going to be a delayed blitz, a straight blitz? Yeah. What, where will the running lane be? You just make need to make him think a little bit longer then maybe you would need to make another quarterback think. Yeah. Because if you give him that comfort, he's going to pick you apart. Well, we're saying it just, he did, he's, he's got the answer for everything right now. All right. That leads to the next question at low lip McGee one, not to be confused with that low lip McGee three Two. Patrick Mahomes is known to regularly shred zone defenses and seeing as how the 49ers run mainly cover three zone. Are they going to switch up and try to run a lot more man coverage or just run zone and try to contain him? The challenge being, of course, can your guys in the secondary play man coverage against yeah. Tyreek Hill, Sammy Watkins, right. Travis Kelsey, Demarcus Robinson, Mecole Hardman? I think it's risky. I, I think they'll dabble in a little man, but I don't think they're going to live in it. I don't. I don't think that's going to happen. I just don't think they have the man-to-man corners to play that style of football. You know, I think ultimately uh, they're going to continue to play their Seattle cover three scheme and try to limit big plays and hope their front four can get there. I, I think that more than, more than anything is what they're going to do. They're, they're just not a team that switches it up a whole lot. And, yeah, when they play man, okay, yeah, they might do it every now and then, but they're, they're going to be wary too. Again, Richard Sherman's he's real good. Mosley's good. But they're not good enough to where I'm going to sit here and go, oh, they're going to be locked on an island versus Tyree Kill and shut him down. No, that's not going to happen. So I do think you're going to see a lot of uh, zone coverage, and we'll see, we'll see what the, uh, the, the Chiefs do to exploit it a little bit. The Chiefs had some losses this year yeah. before Patrick Mahomes was injured when he was full strength or close to it. He had that ankle injury week one against the Jaguars that continued to hamper him, and we really hadn't seen him at 100% until the postseason, I believe. But they lost at home to the Colts. Yeah. They lost at home to the Texans. Right. Did you see anything in what those teams did that made you think there could be some breadcrumbs there that would be relevant to the 49ers? Well, I, I did. I, I mean, if you asked me this question five weeks ago, I would have said yes. But the, the Kansas City offense evolved really ever since, I feel like, honestly, the Chargers game in Mexico. All right, Mike? That was the game that turned it for me. The Chargers game in Mexico, if anybody remembers, and again, the Chargers play the same scheme as the San Francisco 49ers. Gus Bradley's their D coordinator. He came from Seattle, was with me in Tampa before he went to Seattle. So um, I think that game made them grow their offense. I think they realized, wow, the Seattle scheme, they're sending everybody deep in these zone coverages. We don't have enough underneath plays to pick people apart that way. And I think they started to grow their offense. And we talked about it a lot as the year went on. And um, uh, I, I, I think they have the answers now, I guess is what I want to say, as compared to then where they were still going like, hey, this is 2018. We're going to throw for 50 touchdowns, send everybody deep, do all that. People caught on to a little bit. They had to adjust. They did adjust and now they're rolling they really got an answer for everything and right now that's an amazing point that is easy to lose sight of in the complexity of the game yeah. at some levels the game is very simple but you know within the flow of a given game right. we see changes within the flow of a season you see changes you because you self-scout yourself you see what you've done you see what maybe you have let other teams right. believe that you are right and you see where the openings are and on their defense you. and you yeah. try to anticipate yeah. where's the opening going to be and right. that's just part of that chess match that injects so much uncertainty when you have two closely matched teams that makes it more exciting because if one side cracks the code on the other it's not going to be a close game. Yeah, no. And I think we're both kind of girding for the possibility that one side is going to crack the code on the other in this and maybe get a couple lucky plays. Yeah, early, right. Bust a coverage, get a touchdown, and just kind of begin the process of breaking the will, and it's not going to be the shootout. You know, we're all hoping for another Rams-Chiefs yeah, from sure. November of 2018. Which it could be that. Right? Um, yep. Yeah. But I, I hear you. No. But, but I just I feel like that there's there's going to be so much in the buildup and so much angst and so much frustration and so much concern and anxiety and worry that somebody could snap easily if they get exploited early on. Well, and it's two teams that we have just seen who can really thrive on momentum. I mean, that's where I think both of these teams. I mean, we've we've seen the 49ers during the year have periods of just 
ripping off points and dominating a certain part of the game. And the same with Kansas City Chiefs. I don't. I mean, Mike, I don't know. I mean, I, I think we're, you know, again, I'm going to predict this game to be a three to six point type of game. But it is the first game to what you're saying, Mike, in a long time. And I don't even know when I have thought of it to be like this. And when's the last time we really had this thought? Where I do look at it a little bit, and I, I, I won't lie and go, I do think there's more of a chance of a blowout happening in the Super Bowl as maybe compared to others, where just one team loses control of the game totally because one offense just catches on fire. And then you're right, defense makes one play why the offense is on fire. And all of a sudden, you know, a 14 point swing becomes a 24 point swing. Who knows what it may be? I do feel like there's more of a possibility this year. I'm not going to say that's what's going to happen, but I think there is more, more of a chance. I feel like if it's going to happen, it's more likely to happen to the Chiefs than to the 49ers because they, they've been in every game they played this year. They haven't been blown out. No. They haven't been handled. They haven't been manhandled. Right. And I think one of Kyle Shanahan's strengths is he won't allow himself to get freaked out if his team falls behind. Right. But there's the Jimmy G factor that we continue to talk about. If they can't run the ball and if they do fall behind, Jimmy G is going to have to get it done with his arm. Yeah. And there's confidence he'll be able to do it. We just haven't seen it recently. So there's question and concern as to whether or not it can get done. All right. Where'd you just leave off there? I left off at Low Lip McGee 1. I don't know what's next. Okay. Pete, what do we do next? No, well, we could just keep throwing them. Yep, let's go to the bartender 420. Should 420, the, your favorite number. You know it, the bartender and 420. Whoa, that's a double whammy. Whoa, he's drinking are, are and in, smoking at the same state? time. I have no idea. No, we're not in a weed legal oh. seat. Even though it's it's Florida, and I feel like it's the Wild West, and everything's legal. Okay, go ahead and sm walk around. Like, I feel like I could smoke joints and, go like, ahead. wheel around my shotgun out here in Florida and be like, I got my Uzi, too. You can definitely <laughs> wheel around the shotgun. Yeah, I, wouldn't the, I wouldn't recommend the I wouldn't recommend joint. That, that tells that. you there's something wrong with the state right there. And, uh, uh, shotgun we'll wheeling around, that's okay. Hey, if you want to come say hi, I don't know. Florida, we're happy to be um, here. Eat, uh, but the, uh, uh, at the bartender 420, should the Niners take an 0-1 Patriots approach versus the greatest show on turf and give the Kansas City wide receivers the underneath to try to put, punish them physically? Oh, hey, be careful. Don't talk about punishing people physically. Oh, watch oh, out. Don't go to, I, it, it's, a, it's a valid question, and uh, I would say yes. I, I think that will be the approach more times than not. Drop back, try to make them execute and go down the field that way, not let it be a two-play drive with two bombs to Tyree Kill or whatever it may be. But as we just talked about I do think Kansas City's learned to how to play that style of football as well they have enough of a short passing game and an attack that way too to where it's not like last year where oh you took away all our bombs and now we don't know what to do they there's more inventory to their offense so I think they'll be able to even if the Niners did take that approach they'll they'll have the answers for it's it. It's almost like converting the cover three into a Tampa two type of a defense it's, where it's you similar in a lot of ways back right right and force them and look what 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 was the big takeaway from 2018? And what was the concern for Patrick Mahomes going into this season? Taking away the big, dramatic, right. dynamic plays and forcing him to be patient. Yeah. And if they drop everybody back, keep everything in front of them, it's going to force him to be patient. And that may be. That may be. And, they, and just squeeze it down in and try to get to him before he can get rid of it. But only give him that look up close where he's going to look yeah. down the field. It's not going to be there. And can they get to him before he finds that guy open underneath? And if he does, so be it. We tackle him and we go on to the next Yeah, I, I think that's going to be a very real attack for them in general. I, I think they, I think if they look at it that way, if we're making Kansas City have to drive 10 plays for touchdowns, they, I bet you the 49ers feel like we're going to win the game. All right, here's a good one. Do you feel Andy Reid is a Hall of Fame coach if he can win the Super Bowl? Okay. I want to ask you that right off the bat. All right. And the rest of the question is, and if so, does he go in as a chief or an eagle? All right. So first off, is Andy Reid a Hall of Fame coach right now for you with or without a Super Bowl win? I think he is just because of his longevity, because of the fact that his teams have always been competitive. He's done it for 20 years. He does have one Super Bowl appearance. Would it be better if he wins one? Yes. But I think that, you know, it's a combination. Dominance championships, statistics, and longevity. Yeah. And it's easier to make that comparison for a player, but for a coach, right? He's done it for 20 years yeah. at a very high level. At some point, you become such a fabric of the game. I mean, think about it. 20% of the entire <laughs> existence of the National Football League, Andy Reid has been a head coach in the National Football League. Yeah. That is a huge accomplishment. And I think for that reason alone, no matter what happens on on Sunday, it's two Super Bowl appearances. Yeah. They can't take this one away from it. Right. It may be a Super Bowl win. We'll see. But I think he's already in. And this whole go in as a chief or an eagle, it doesn't matter. That's not how it works in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. You just go in. You don't go in with any specific designation. Right. Well, and I just I want to I just want to say this too about that. First off, like I'm with you on the Andy Reid thing. I just don't understand why. 
again, there's, I feel like other people with this resume have already been looked over and we don't even talk about it. Like I, I brought up Dan Reeves today on PFT. He's been to four Super Bowls, went right. to three with one team and one with another, and then some playoff appearances with the, with the team in between that. Nobody ever talks about like a, a Hall of Fame for Dan Reeves. Here's the problem. And Shereen Williams, who's one of the Hall of Fame voters, mentioned this earlier today on PFT Live. When you have the coaches in the same bucket with all the players, it's hard for it, the coaches to stand it out. It is. I know. So they use this 15-person centennial class as a way right. to wedge a couple of coaches in, and they have the contributor category that they use for coaches. They're talking about having a separate coaches category, and it could be contributor, senior, coach every year. Yeah. In addition to the five player finalists, a contributor, a coach, and a senior every year. Right now, it's two contributors one year, one senior the next year, and then it flips. Mm. I could see contributor, coach, senior, and a coach gets... Because I think there's enough coaches out there that are worthy of it. I think there's one coach a year that deserves to get in. And if it's one year where there just isn't one, then so be it. He doesn't get in. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I'm not sure about this whole That's thing. That's how you get Mike Shanahan in. That's I know. That's how you get Mike Holmgren in. I mean, these guys should be in. Well, I know. I mean, Mike Shanahan, I just, you know, I guess this is what we're only into, like, his first or second year eligibility. But, I mean, I just haven't heard his name. Like, he's a shoe in Like, I don't even understand that. Why we're like, why we have to have a special category to get a guy like that in, I don't understand. I want to fast forward yeah. 30 years. Yeah. I don't because I may not be alive then. But let's say 30 years from now, your tattoo buddy Kyle Shanahan gets in. Yeah. Will his bust have his trucker hat on it? <laughs> that would be awesome. He, I love how it's called a trucker hat, too. First off, like, he's so not a trucker. He's such a – he's a skater, all right? That's what he is. That's a skater here's hat. Here's the thing, though. <laughs> he loves the hat. Yes. He wears the hat. Right. And he's sensitive to criticism he about is, the hat. We know he is because had, we had a friend who said some things about him, and he let us know, like, get off my back with my damn hat. So, uh, yeah. Is he, it is it really like a good luck charm at this point? Like the hat, like they've been, like, it's I, I would bet you it's something like that. I would, I would bet you. He, I haven't had that conversation it's the white with top. him. He, started, he kept wearing the white yes, top he that keeps, they rolled he out back that in white October. Top, right. and, the, and the red trucker hat. And the hat. red trucker hat. Yeah. So, we'll see. Um, all right. Tyler Skelton, all right. If there was a Hunger Games between the Niners and the Chiefs, every man for himself who would win i love these questions tyler skelton because anybody that listens to me you know i'm into the bar th the bar fight theory right i mean to me yes you know you take a lot of the good teams in football and i just say if a, bra a brawl broke out between the good teams in football a lot of the teams we see in the final four the final eight would be in the the final four the final eight of the nfl brawl too who are you taking in a Hunger Games? Wait, I just want to be clear that yeah. this is a context where it is acceptable to talk about people trying to injure other people. Yes. Is this an acceptable This context? is acceptable. Okay. Yes. This is acceptable. Uh, probably the 49ers because they have Nick Bosa. Yeah. <laughs> I think it would be like Nick Bosa, like the other guys would stand back. Let me, let me go ultra nerd. If we're going to talk Hunger Games, I'm going to go Lord of the Rings. I would say Nick Bosa would be the Balrog. That would just show up and everybody else just freezes. The Balrog, and lets yeah. The Balrog just like right. kill everybody. I think that's Armstead and Buckner. They're the Balrogs. They're like the two true. I'm I think the, if it went down. Yeah. I think if it went down. Right. I think that Nick Bosa would 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 if, prevail. Especially, yeah, I think yeah. he would. I think he would do some research on who his great grandfather was. He would if it went that way. Hey. Where weapons were involved. It would it would it would go Nick Bosa's way. That's all I'm going to say about it. Well, I. I, I'm I'm taking the I'm taking the 49ers as well. First off, the 49ers we saw them in person. You heard me raving about it. They're one of those teams where you just watch them go on the field and you go, "Holy f are they big? Holy shit! It's just one good looking guy after another." Now, and let, let me just say this. Yeah. I, I, so everybody knows what I'm referring to. Yeah. Somebody sent me a story. I didn't know about this. Nick and Joey Bosa's grandfa great grandfather was the mob boss in Chicago that. Took over after Al Capone. Whoa, yeah. I did not know yeah. that. That's amazing. I like yeah. them more now. <laughs> I like them more. Yeah. Well, I, I'll say this. I met, I mean, I've met Nick Bosa's father, uh, and I was talking to Joe and Nick, Joey Bosa, and Nick Bosa's father before the 49ers Vikings game. But then I also got to meet Mrs. Bosa. All right. So, you know, for all those out there, you know, I'm into scouting all things, body parts, moms, dads, whatever it may Here be. Here we go. All right. Send your emails hey, to Ms. Christopher David Ms. Sims. Mrs. Bosa is like is like Barbara Sims, my grandmother. She can play middle linebacker in football too. She's got the size and measurables to do it. It's no disrespect. She's a very nice looking woman. I'm just saying her DNA traits and were there to make right NFL now. football players. Deal That'll with that, everybody. Fine. That that will that will make fine. it. That made it. That will be okay. fine, Bernard.
everybody. It's my podcast, and that's what I wanted to say. Tony right? Accardo <laughs> is the name of the great grandfather of Nick and Joey Bosa, who ran say hello the Chicago to my... outfit. Uh, that's amazing. By 16, he was working for Jack Machine Gun McGurn, one of Al Capone's hitmen. I mean, this is all written. This was if uh, Nick Bosa and Joey Bosa had machine guns, mafia style, like they would be the baddest people on earth. They already like, are without I them. I know. That's what I mean. Like you couldn't mess with them. You'd be like, I don't know. My bullets aren't penetrating their skin, but somehow they're beating me up. I don't know. All right. Um, here we go. What'd you so say, we established Pete? it's the 49ers. I think we're on the we're on the 49ers and we're gonna go to El Taco, okay? El Taco wants to know who would win in a sumo wrestling concert. I'm not I, aware I think of a sumo it, wrestling concert. I think it's a contest. Pete Dimalitis can't spell. He probably messed it up. Fletcher Cox or Aaron Donald, who wins in a sumo wrestling contest? Whoa. Oh, oh we we've been around Aaron Donald. Aaron Donald is carved out of granite, yes. immovable, and too, and too fast. We, we've seen the videos of him like right. practicing with fake knives. Right. And I, I, I think that, that Aaron Donald would lock onto him and have him move before he even <laughs> realizes what's happened. Right? It would I don't just be know. over. I don't know if I'm on that. No, I am. Have you met Fletcher Cox? Yes. Fletcher Cox is enormous. And he's got, he's pretty damn quick too. I'm afraid like if if Fletcher Cox and Aaron Donald might like go against each other, it'd be a little bit like the bear versus the lion, where the lion starts out the fight dominating, but he runs out of stamina because he's just all muscle and everything like that, and the bear kind of just takes on the blows and then wears out the lion who runs out of energy. So I think I'm going Fletcher Cox. I'm just letting you know. I'm going Fletcher Cox. I don't know anything about the overall <laughs> physical abilities and endurance qualities of lions and bears. All I know the, is it's a thing. I had an image of Aaron Donald being here with us this week. Right. And last year we did whether or not George Kittle could push you off the stage. This is a bigger stage. Oh, Aaron Donald got Aaron more. Donald no, no, with thank no, you. With no step. <laughs> yeah. Right. Just standing right. still. One shove. Can you throw from one Chris from one other. to the end? Yeah, he could. I mean, yeah, to, to Mike's point, Aaron Donald is like one of those guys that it's muscles in his ears. And if we stuck a knife in his chest, the knife would bend. Not nothing. No puncture. Stuck a knife. Stuck a knife. Stuck a knife. Yep. We stuck, we stuck a knife. knife. We stuck a knife in his chest, and it did not bend. Marshmallow Mafia. Okay, doesn't sound like a real tough mafia. I thought you over the weekend. Yeah. I was reading yeah. transcripts from Kyle Shanahan on Friday. Oh, okay. And he was talking about his relationship with Jimmy Garoppolo, and he said, "I don't think I'm an authoritarian." I hope I use that word correctly. My wife is going to make fun of me. It's like, man, that's Sims. That is Sims. Just go ahead and say it and worry later whether or not you use the right word. That he is. got it right. He did. He got it right. No. But, uh, to, 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 to that point, when he was in Tampa and I was the starting quarterback and he was quality control, I would have interviews every now and then, and he would see them and text me, him and his wife, to be like, you didn't use that word right or you used this wrong or I can't believe you pulled that out of your ass and got that one right. So, uh, yes, his wife will We'll get on yeah, him if he used it good. wrong. Uh, Marshmallow Mafia wants to know who has the better special teams unit between KC and San Francisco. We were just talking about this a little bit. Um, it's first Nicole off. Hartman gives Kansas City the edge. I think so. Right? I think that's if you had to boil it down because both are really good on special teams. They really are. I mean, I, okay, the 49ers, I'm going to give them an advantage with field goal kicking. I am with Robbie Gold, but it's not like the four, uh, the Chiefs are, are hurting in that department. But I, I think you, you made the point. The McCall Hardman is a game changer. Both these teams play all three phases, but we've seen in this playoffs already that Hardman can change the momentum of a game like he did in the Texans. I'd love to know if the Chiefs would have drafted me McCall Hardman if the Tyreek Hill legal question hadn't emerged right when it did remember that troubling audio came out the first night of the draft just an hour before the draft started and it threw Tyreek Hill's availability for the entire season into question they drafted Nicole Hardman the next night if that hadn't happened remember they they banished him from the offseason program and and it had a very ominous feel to it would they have taken Hardman but for what happened with Hill and if they wouldn't have in a weird sort of way, it was a blessing in disguise. It is. You're because right. now they have this guy who can be a game breaker in the return game right. to go along with Tyreek Hill and develop into an alternative to Sammy Watkins or Tyreek Hill at some point down the line. I think that's the point. Like, oh, if we don't have Sammy after this year, okay, big deal. We got McCole Hardman. Oh, if Sammy or Tyreek Hill got hurt this year, 
okay, well, we got McCole Hardman. And guess what? Both of those guys missed time this year to where McCole Hardman came in and, and was a factor. So uh, I and, and it's you know what? You said something about not having Sammy Watkins yeah. after this year. He's only under contract for one more year. Right. He's got a huge cap number. He's got a huge salary. And if they're going to pay Patrick Mahomes, they're going to have to make some tough decisions. And they may have to go to Sammy Watkins and say, I would think we want you to be. take less money. And because, you know, he's had a, a big performance in the postseason. Yeah. Brett Veach, the GM, came out and said, we signed him for these moments. People would be surprised if he's gone. But remember when he signed that contract, we said this is a better deal than what but OBJ back right, signed. Right. But, but they, they may have to put the squeeze on him because once you put $40 million or more per year in the pocket of Patrick Mahomes, you're going to have to make some tough decisions. And if you think there's not that big of a gap between Miko Hardman and Sammy Watkins – Maybe you put the squeeze on Watkins uh, to take some less money or take a hike. I think you're right, spot on. Or trade him. Well, I right. mean, if it all comes to oh, I think he is. Sell, sell high. Perfect time. Trade him to somebody else that last year of the contract and get something in return and then draft younger guys. They're going to need to have focus on younger, cheaper guys they are. once they pay Patrick He's, he's a movable piece. I yeah. do look at that way. I, I think you're you're 100% right there. Uh, and, and the production doesn't match what they're paying him. Again, I mean, listen, guys, everybody, they're, they're, they're paying him like – you know, he's Antonio Brown or Odell or Mike Evans or DeAndre, and it's just not. So, to me, he, he has a, a very real chance of not being a part of that team uh, next year, and, and part of that is because of McCole Hardman. Where do you want to go, Pete? Come on, let's go, man. Here we go, number nine. I got it. So, Reed, let me listen to this. All right, listen to this out. Here we go. Steven Pipes. At C Sims QB, why does Mike Florio hate the 49ers so much? Is it because of Sherman? Steven Pites replying. Okay, that's him. Now Ruben M gets in. Ruben M goes, oh, huh? Here we he go. suggested really? taking cheap shots at Mahomes. I want to see these to injure fans. him in order to win the Super Bowl. If anything, he wants them to win. And then Michael Williams sent morons. Yes. They found my burner account. <laughs> Bourbon um, Street Saints, you have found my burner account. Well done, Pete. Florio does not hate the 49ers. First off, all fan bases have to start stop doing this just because, like, maybe we said it's one okay. negative thing. I understand, thing, it. I understand but. it. That's the way it is. Chris Collinsworth tells the story. He gets asked all the time, why do you hate the Giants? Why do you hate the Chiefs? Why do you hate the Packers? Why That's do you hate the That's the way it goes. I and saw my dad just, for years. Eventually, he said, I just do. Right. Because you can't win. No. They're never going to accept your explanation. And that's kind of where I've gotten to with this whole question of what I said last week about defending against a mobile Patrick Mahomes yeah. and what the 49ers may do differently than what the Titans did who were afraid to go touch him. If people are going to come to the wrong conclusion about what I said, if people are going to assume that means I don't like Patrick Mahomes, I don't like the Chiefs, if they, boy, that could really be taken out of context. If they're going to come to the conclusion that I feel that way, they're in a damn thing I can do about it. I know how I feel. Mahomes knows how I feel. I know the how Chiefs you feel. Know how I feel. You love Mahomes. Most of, the Chiefs, most of the Chiefs know how I feel. No, you love him. And you love him. He is your favorite player. I mean, he is. I don't care what you say. Really, ever since preseason of 2018, he's your favorite player. I don't know what you think who is your favorite player. I'm just telling you, nobody you talk about more glowingly than Patrick Mahomes. He's revolutionized now, the game. Right. He was eclipsed by Lamar Jackson for a while this year, but when it became money time, what happened? Mahomes comes back from a 24 nothing deficit. Lamar Jackson doesn't come back from a slimmer deficit than that. That's Mahomes has stepped up. Mahomes is great. Yeah. It was all a part of an effort to explain what the Titans did wrong and what the 49ers may do differently if Patrick Mahomes decides he's going to run the football because it still is football. And the thing that we have been harping on all year long – quarterbacks doing that okie doke near the sideline where they act like they're going out of bounds. Yeah. The defenders pull up and the quarterback steals another 10 yards. You can't have that mentality with a Super Bowl on the line that you're going to err on the side of not going anywhere near him yeah. because no, he's going to keep on the going. Other side. He's going to keep going. Yeah, err on hitting him as his foot's about to go out of bounds and you, and you, and, and and you take a shot. Whole, that's what I said. And it's, it's amazing. You see the words on paper and it's like, how are people interpreting when I say if he's close to the sideline or if maybe he started into a slide? Because here's the thing. If a guy's running at you, and you decide you're going to lock on and go get him, and you're going into that tackling posture, once you commit, if he starts to slide, you're f you're, f you're going to hit him, and you're yep. drawing a flag. So yep. what happens is 11, 18 Easter, are Eastern so time. You finally said f oh, finally. We said it oh, like 50 okay. times I wasn't sure you did. Beginning. I wasn't sure I and, did. And so, um, and so the point is when you are fearful of the gray area, he's going to run right by you. 
That's the I, point. I, I know. Your so, point's right, anyway. Mike. And he did to uh, to my man, Stephen Pipes. And I don't hate Richard Sherman. Well, I disagree with him on the concept of whether or not players should represent themselves. Right. I don't think he represented himself well. And his ego is preventing him from admitting that he did a bad job of negotiating his own contract. Ego gets involved, and that gets in the way, and he chooses to be very hostile Well, then he falsely accused you of, like, exactly. a yeah, bad yeah. business uh, yeah, model. Of having, and of having uh, agents, agents involved, investors. which, like, like, trust me, Mike doesn't have agents involved in this, okay? All right, but, Mike? But, but the point is this. Yeah. The point is this. It's okay to have differences of opinion with people. It's okay to have a rough assessment, a, a, an aggressive assessment, a strong view. That doesn't mean you dislike somebody. You're just giving your viewpoint on the way things are and maybe the way things could be or should be. That's all it is. I, I, I hate all teams equally. Well, but no, no, you don't. You like the Vikings more. But then, I, uh, really, but you after, also, after this you year. don't hate the 49ers either, just to set that straight. You, you rooted for the Vikings. You wanted them to win. You thought Aaron Rodgers might pull magic out last week. I want to be and right. And you questioned Ultimately, Jimmy Garoppolo a little bit during the year. It's not a hate at, of the 49ers. At, at the end of the day, when we lock in, we have a competitive thing with our picks. Yeah. And MDS and I have had it for years. You want to be right. Right. If, if I'm going to pick the winner of every game, I am rooting to be right. That's it. That's yeah. who I root for. Who And I'm like, well, you're, you only pick the Packers to win because you don't like the 49ers. What the? I want to be right. I'm not going to allow. Oh, well, I really, you know, Richard Sherman was mean to me, and I'm going to ignore my belief that the 49ers are the better team. I mean, I, I stupidly talked myself into thinking the Packers would win the game. That was stupid. Right. I admit it. I'm right. stupid. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's just, it's, that's all right. If, hey. If that's the worst, see, here's the thing. I practiced law for 18 years. And when you practice law in a litigation environment, half the people you deal with, half the people hate you. Yeah. The lawyers, the witnesses, the parties. Sure. You're always fighting. You're always accusing. You're always arguing. And any day that less than half the people I'm around hate me is a pretty good day in comparison yeah. to what I used to have. Yeah. So... All right. Yeah, so well, this is a good it. day. I mean, we, we, we more I'd than say half about 30% like you here. Of the people. I'd say about 30% more than half. of the people here. Um, all right. I got I'll Brian Walton. Brian Walton, who do you think Debo's ceiling player comparison is? This is from at Brian Walton 23. It's a good question. Debo, I will say this, just to start off this conversation. He's a part of this new breed at wide receiver in football. I don't even almost look at them as wide receivers. They're more like weapons to me um, because they can do so much. He's He is a... He is a wide receiver in a running back's body. That's where he is different than most out there. And when I think of guys like him right now, I don't know if there's a whole lot of like, like a Juju Smith-Schuster, maybe Juju, but I think he's more explosive yeah. than Juju with the ball in his hand and stuff, right? I thought of like Pete Dimalitis just said Percy Harvin. I get that. I think he's bigger than Percy and not as fast as Percy. I mean, Percy was world class there for a while. Um, I've also thought of like even a Jarvis Landry. That way, where, you know, it's just he can get the full speed in two steps and he is aggressive and can make people miss when he's got the ball in his hands. But, you know, it's rare. It's, this is where, like him and the kid in Tennessee, A.J. Brown, they're similar that way. Yeah. You know, they're these physical guys who are six foot, six one, you know, 215, 220, got legs and power underneath them to where they can break tackles, but yet they're playing wide receiver. So I know that wasn't the greatest answer in the world, no, but I think right. this is a new yeah. breed of guy, and there's not a lot of comparisons and to it's them. The willingness of the coach to spot the talent to run the ball, yeah. to use him right. in the running game, that's one of the ways these guys buy in. George Kittle buys in to the running game because he loves blocking. Debo buys in because he gets a couple of carries a game. Sure. It's easier to get him to go out and block for the running backs if he knows he's going to get some 100%, of the wealth. 100%. You're right. And, and uh, it's, it's identifying guys that you think can do things that you want them to do, trusting them to do it. You know, when you think about it, these receivers, and, and we see more receiver runs than we used to. I remember it used to be a big deal when there would be an end around. That was the only time you ever yeah. saw a receiver touch the football. He never lined up in the backfield. It would be an end around. But now we see the jet sweeps. We see the little, the little touch pass. We see a lot of opportunities to get the ball into the hands of a receiver who can do something with it when he gets it behind the line of scrimmage, not down the field. And I think it's smart to be creative with it. I, I agree. And, you know, to what Pete Dimalitis just said, too, that's, that was the Percy Harvin role, too. He was one of the first guys to be that type of player. Put him a tailback. Hey, think about Andy Reid, Tyree Kill. I mean, Tyree Kill is nothing more than a third down running back, but he's playing receiver and just has more straightaway speed. He's almost built like that. There was a stretch in 2012 and he's a early on where Percy Harvin actually was getting league MVP. Bump. Oh, I remember. He, was having. he was special. I mean, Percy Harvin. 
Harvin was a game changer. He really was. Um, so, all right, that's it. We're done. We're out of here. We're done. Wow. They want to wrap it. They don't want to make it long. We got more, more stuff coming as the week goes on. Remember, check out me and Florio Wednesday night, 5 to 7, the Irish Playwright Pub, okay? Close enough. Uh, Irish, Playwright Irish Pub. Play, yeah, you know what I Eventbrite. mean. Eventbrite.com. <sighs> Tickets available. Got it. Roger Goodell will not be there. His evil twin brother will be. The backup singer on the top left will be there, though, with Frankie Valley. Maybe. We're not sure. And then check us out all Valley week. Alive. Uh, I think he is, yeah. Right. Are you and sure about that? I'm, I'm pretty sure. I met him once. Um, yeah, I met him once at the Lake Tahoe Golf Tournament, actually, when I was younger. It was kind of cool to meet him. I didn't know how big of a deal he was then. Uh, but check us out. PFT all week. We got great guests. We'll be right here. I'll protect Mahomes and the hatred he's getting from Florio, okay? I'll back him off. Don't worry. He won't hurt my little Mahomie anymore. Frankie Valley's still alive, by the way. Is he good? Still okay. Alive. All right. Peace out. See ya. Say bye. Later. Later. Yo, yo, what's up? Come on, man. Subscribe on YouTube to Chris Sims Unbuttoned Podcast. I need you. Please hit the subscribe button, please.